Hello and welcome to a brand new episode of Instacar HK. Today we're at our friend's garage where he houses his impressive and diverse collection. And by diverse, I mean he has this Porsche 356, a Datsun Fair Lady, a Honda NSX right here, Apollo Gumpert. But today we're here for one specific and unique car. One car that's very close to my heart because it is legitimately my personal, personal dream car. And that is this 1994 Ferrari 512TR. Now the 512TR is of course part of the Ferrari Testarossa lineup, which owned the 80s uh, in terms of fashion, in terms of cult following. Every one of you would have heard of the hit TV show Miami Vice, where Don Johnson was drifting around in a beautiful white Testarossa around Miami, and celebrities such as Michael Jordan, Elton John, all had Testarossas. Now the Testarossa line was produced between 1984 to 1996. It began with the original model, the Testarossa, and in 1991, Ferrari released this 512TR, where they made about 2,200 units. For the final two years of production, Ferrari released the final version being the F512M, which was a limited edition, and they only released 501 units. Now this, being the flagship model at the time was right in the middle of the rivalry between Ferrari and Lamborghini. Shortly after the Mirror, Ferrari reacted and released the Berlinetta Boxer, where they also put a 12-cylinder engine at the back. Boxer started with the 365 BB, and then the 512 BB, and finally the 512 BBI, I meaning fuel injection. Now, after the 512 BBI, came the new model, the Testarossa. Now, while the Berlinetta Boxer was very beautiful and capable, it's also one of my favorite and dream cars, it was kind of outdated in terms of design when compared to the Testarossa. The Testarossa had a lot of improvements, one of which was particularly important because it defined the whole car's amazing, iconic shape, and that is the radiators. In the Berlinetta Boxer, the radiator of the car was in the front, despite the engine being at the back. What that means is all the coolant hoses that run between the engine and the radiator have to go through the car's cabin, making it very hot on hot days. And I can attest to that because my 328 was from the same era and had the exact same design. And in hot Hong Kong weather like this, often I can feel the heat from within the cabin. So when it came to the Testarossa, Ferrari decided to split the radiators to two and put it in the engine bay at the side, right behind this vent you see here, which also created these iconic cheese graters, these straights, you know, they call cheese graters of the Testarossa, where they direct cold air into the radiator. What that also means was that the engine bay became wider, hence the wide, famous look of the Testarossa. Now the Testarossa was actually six inches wider than the Berlinetta Boxer. And back then, a lot of people criticized it of being too big. A criticism which is laughable in today's standard because for today, the Testarossa is actually in the perfect size. So aside from a lot of upgrades in the engine, Ferrari also updated the looks of the 512TR, as you see. The front end with the older Testarossa looked a lot more rigid with huge rectangular front headlights and the grille that goes from side to side. With this one, everything is a bit smaller, everything's a bit cleaner. The front headlights are smaller, the front grille is smaller. 
And the wheels on this car was also enlarged to uh, 18 inches, which really helped road holding as well. But regardless of which it is, you know, the Testarossa or the TR or the 512M, I think we can all agree that the Testarossa looks so iconic that regardless of what era you're in, if you see one on the streets back in 1984 or in today, 2021, you will still be shocked. Everyone stops. It's just a showstopper. Now, it's time for me to go for a drive. I've been waiting for this day forever. And let's see. And another thing before I get in, you can't see any door handles here, which also shows the design. The door handle is actually hidden. Now, immediately once you're in here, it feels, as you would expect, a lot roomier than the V8 Ferraris of the same era, which I, um, I've tried a number of times before, including my own 328. The car is roomier, but other than that, everything, the smell and everything feels familiar uh, as my 328 or 308 that we tested. Um, the other thing is these seats have been updated. Uh, in the Testarossa, it is um, very 80s with very squarey seats and headrest, but by the, by the 512TR, it was a 90s car, so things have been updated. And the car still feels new. It doesn't feel old inside. It doesn't feel too outdated. Obviously, leather all around. So let's start. Fuel injected car, obviously, so no need for you know stepping on the gas pedal or anything like that. Listen to that roar. Wow. I'm expecting good things from this. Just the moment it roars, you can, you know, it's something different. All right, now, let's step on it. Clutch. Finally, I found a heavy clutch. This car's clutch is heavier than all the other cars I've tried before. I have been told these 12 cylinder Ferraris of these era do have heavier clutches, um, but it's not too bad. It's not really hard that you can't step on it. But I think I can imagine you're know, doing traffic. It will be a bit tough, but luckily there's no traffic today. So let's go. Like my 328, it's a dog leg first. And also it has a fly off handbrake. This is a five speed open gated manual gearbox and let's go. Right, clutch is heavy, but setting off, it's not that hard. I think to be fair, part of it, why, you know, part of the reason why it's quite easy for me to set off in is because I am relatively more familiar with manual Ferraris, but I think for, for someone who haven't driven one before, they may need some time getting used to. The ride is good. It's not, you know, too bumpy or anything. And unlike the Murcielago I tried earlier, you don't feel nearly as wide. As mentioned, this car was wide for its time, but for now, it's actually quite decent. All right, the car has been warmed up, so let's give it some juice. I'm sure you guys heard all of that. I was deliberately not talking because I've been told I was talking too much last time in the Murchilago video, so people couldn't really hear the car. Now, wow. I'm sorry, but this, the 12 cylinder in this car sounded even more aggressive, even more potent than the Murchilago. Just listen to it, this second gear. expected because this is an older generation car 
by the time of the Merchant Lago, as you have read in my blog, www.instacarhk.com, the car is a lot more civilized, it's very comfortable, it's a, it looks, and it is a, a super hyper car, but inside it's, it's a very conventional uh, car, not, not much convenience, the engine is not as loud, everything is just comfortable and easy, you know, grand tour in the modern day, expecting you to drive a Merchant Lago, you know, cross continent. Yeah, but the TR being from an earlier generation, although it is also a Grand Tour, it is also expected to cover you know, long distances across continental Europe. But at the end of the day, with the technology and the style back then, cars are still inevitably more raw. So from the steering, the steering is very heavy, the clutch is heavy, the car, although comfortable, is bouncier than, than the 203 Merchilago. And most importantly, the engine note, as I mentioned, is very potent and loud even inside the car, not just outside the car. But regardless, oh, that V12 Glory, that V12 Glory is just... I am so fortunate, honestly, I'm so fortunate that with this channel, I have had so many generous owners allowing me to try these special cars. I mean, none of my 360, 328 can ever compare with this. I mean, this, listen to this, this is just something else. I've ever dreamt of for a dream 12 cylinder Ferrari. Just listen to the downshift. I'm going on third now. Second. The brakes are very good. The brakes are very good. The moment you step on it, immediately stops. Now, admittedly, this car is not as fast as the Merchilago, for obvious reasons. This car is older. It's down on more than 100 horsepower than the Merchilago. But uh, when you're in this sort of scenario, in these circumstances, with that engine note in Hong Kong, it doesn't really matter if it's not as fast. In fact, the Merchilago would be too fast for Hong Kong. Whereas this one, it fits a lot better. Now, I keep comparing the two. Obviously, they are two very different cars. It just so happens that you know we reviewed these two cars very you know close time to each other. But I think the perfect garage would be to have both this and the modern V12 Lamborghini. really thankful for the owner for letting me try his pride and joy this I'll remember this for decades to come it's great so all Testarossas have the glorious Ferrari flat 12 engine with four valves per cylinder the original Testarossa produced about 390 horsepower but by the time of this car Ferrari actually made a lot of upgrades to the engine. So this car is more than just a mere facelift. The upgrades that Ferrari did to the engine of this car, among other things, included a new intake system, a new exhaust system, and a completely new Bosch engine management system. The result of which is that this car produces 430 horsepower and can go from zero to 60 in 4.8 seconds, which for early 90s was very impressive. If you look at this engine, some of you may know that Ferrari put together their 12 cylinder engines a bit different than their contemporaries at the time. So for example, uh, the Lamborghini Countach had its gearbox in the front and the engine at the back, but Ferrari put the gearbox actually underneath the engine. Uh, as you can see here, the engine, if you pull it out, the engine actually looks like it wraps around the gearbox. Now what happens with this is that the engine becomes very tall, uh, very high, and that causes two problems. One is the center of gravity of the engine becomes a bit high, 
and you will hear from owners that if they're on track and on limit, the cars sometimes have this uh, uh, snap oversteer issue because the weight transfers so quickly and violently. And secondly, uh, because the engine is put like that, all the important parts as the engine is placed in the longitude uh, direction, all the important parts are right at the front of the, of the engine, behind the passenger and driver's seat. This means that for parts like the cam belt, where you have to change routinely every three to five years, the whole engine has to come out because otherwise there's just no way a mechanic can reach the cam belts in the front. For the Testarossa, it takes 30 hours to change the cam belt to take the engine out. And it's already actually better because for the Testarossa, the engine suspension and all the brake parts are actually attached to a detachable subframe where you can just take the subframe out and the entire piece comes down. But even then, it takes 30 hours. With the 512TR, Ferrari, in order to address the high center of gravity issue, took out the subframe. There's no subframe, so there's no shortcut to take the engine out. So for this car, if you need to change the cam belt, the engine has to come from the top, to come out from the top, which takes even more time at 40 hours. Now, what this means is that while for cars like my 328, where you don't have to take the engine out to change the belts, it costs about 30,000 Hong Kong dollars to train, change the belts if you bring it back to the dealer. But for a 12-cylinder Ferrari, like the Testarossa and the 512TR, it will cost more than double that just to change the belt because of all the labor involved. Now, unfortunately, because of all the service and maintenance issues I discussed about just now, in 1996, after the release of the F512M, then Ferrari president Luca de Montezemolo decided to scrap the mid-engine 12-cylinder layout of Ferrari, something I'll never forgive him for. Now, they, although the 550 Maranello that replaced it was also a very beautiful and iconic car, it can't compare with something like this. I mean, since then, Ferrari never made anything nearly as beautiful as the Ferrari Testarossa or Berlinetta Boxer. The reason Luca de Montezemolo went back to the front engine layout like the 550 is because maintenance and access to engine parts was a lot easier for a front engine car. But in any event, I'm just very glad I lived through the era where cars like this was at their prime. And most importantly, today, I get to experience this car personally for the first time ever. Now, if you enjoyed this episode as much as I enjoyed the car, please give us a like and subscribe. Please also click the bell button so you know when our next video is coming up and we'll have more Casa Car videos coming out very soon. Thank you.